Well, we continue our discussion of mainstream popular music in the period before 1955, the world before rock and roll. In the first two videos, we talked about how an important thing for us to know is that the song's the thing, not a particular performance of it, and how a lot of songs um, were marketed via sheet music, and that was one of the most important ways of making money in the publishing business, and publishers are very, very important. They're really sort of driving the bus here when it comes to the popular music business in this period before 1955. Um, we also talked about how the important role that radio played in creating a national audience for mainstream pop. Now, not so much country and western and rhythm and blues, and we're going to talk about that in a future video here coming just up. But for now, uh, mainstream pop uh, sets up, um, radio sets up a national audience for mainstream pop, and then we said a little bit, uh, in movies to a certain extent too, but then we said a little bit about how that, that national audience is going to migrate to television, and it will leave opportunities for rhythm and blues in country and western in the period after the Second World War, after 1945, uh, when it does. So now, what we want to talk about is what the mainstream popular music sound like like during these years, this period from say about oh, 19, the 1920s uh, into the period leading up to 1955. So I'm going to go through a lot of names here and remembering that it's going to be up to you to find some of this music and listen to it. And I really encourage you to do so. It's, it's really no fun to take a music course if you never hear any music. So you really need to go out and look for some of this music. So I'll run through some of these performers for you and then you can check them out and see what you think for yourself. Plenty of other information about them, not only in the book, but also on all kinds of sources on the internet. So you want to check this out. Maybe the most important artist we need to mention for the period, the first half of the 20th century. One of the most successful, one of the most influential uh, artists uh, in the first half of the 20th century was Bing Crosby. These days, Bing Crosby is maybe a little bit sort of ignored or forgotten, but he was a fantastic star, a singer who is maybe the first singer, or at least one of the first singers, to really take advantage of the microphone. And that the singers before Bing Crosby's day didn't have the advantage or weren't really trained to use microphones. And they, every, all their, their performances were done acoustically. So they had to have voices that cut to the back of the hall, that cut over the orchestra, and so you got these really big voices. Not exactly operatic voices, but you get the idea. Uh, voices that could really cut through. With the invention of the microphone, it meant that it wasn't so important how loud you sang. You could get the microphone right up next to your mouth, and that allowed for a certain kind of intimacy, a certain amount of um, sort of vocal technique that didn't require the big voice but could require other er areas of the voice. And Bing Crosby was one of the first crooners to really uh, develop that technique and that, that sense of intimacy. Now, in Bing Crosby's case, the intimacy was never thought of as something that was even remotely romantic in any kind of way. Bing Crosby was more like everybody's favorite uncle. He played golf, he smoked, smoked a little cigar, I mean a little, uh, a little pipe, he always had a nice sort of knit uh, uh, sweater on. He was absolutely non-threatening, he, was a, he was just seemed like a really nice old uncle, the kind of guy who you were happy to see at Thanksgiving meals and Christmas time and when you went on picnics in the, in the summertime. And uh, so that was the image that he, that he fostered, but he was enormously successful. As I said, hosting a coast-to-coast a, a -coast radio show for years it was number, one of the number one celebrities appearing in films and having a whole string of hit records uh, up into the 1940s and 50s. Some of those would be uh, songs like I've Got a Pocket Full of Dreams from 1938, Only Forever from 1940, Swingin' on a Star from 1944, and his famous recording of White Christmas, which went to number one in the charts both in 1942 and again in 1940. 45. So Bing Crosby, a very, very important figure who characterizes much of what was going on in mainstream pop in the period uh, before, at least before the Second World War. Also in mainstream pop, we have to think about the big bands. And the big bands are usually thought of uh, when we think about the, uh, the history of jazz music, because they were so important. Paul Whiteman's band was one of the most important uh, early instances of that. And the interesting thing about the big bands is they weren't really about the singing at all. It was about the bands, it was about the playing. This is back in a day when a, a band's job like a rock band in a club today, is really to go to a dance and to keep people dancing, right? Their job was to keep them, uh, keep them on the dance floor. 
And so these guys, these big bands were often called dance bands. You had Paul Whiteman with a band, uh, virtuoso clarinetist Benny Goodman with a band. Other bands came from Tommy Dorsey, uh, Jimmy Dorsey, uh, and Glenn Miller. Um, in the African-American community, you had the Duke Ellington Band and also the Count Basie Band. There was some crossover there, but mostly the white bands played the white venues and the black uh, bands played the black venues. We're still talking about a country that's very segregated uh, during these years. If you want to look for a particular example of what the big band sound was like, I would recommend String of Pearls, which is kind of the signature tune for the Glenn Miller Orchestra. It was a number one hit in this country in 1942. If you listen to String of Pearls, you'll get kind of an idea of what big band music was about during this period. We also had a lot of singing groups. Uh, the Andrews Sisters, three, uh, three singing sisters from Minnesota, singing in harmony vocal with a kind of a debt. Some of their vocal uh, stylings, the harmony vocal stylings, almost had a debt to big band horn section. So the ways in which they would harmonize together almost sounded like uh, saxophones or trumpets or trombones uh, in, a, in a big band arrangement. Some of the, their most important tunes uh, were uh, In the Mood. They took this Glenn Miller hit In the Mood and put lyrics with it. So there you really get the connection between the vocals and, and the big band technique, the big band horn technique. But also uh, from 1938, Bymir Bisdu Shern, and from 1943, Shoo Shoo Baby, and from 1945, Rum and Coca-Cola, the Andrews sisters would often appear with Bing Crosby on his radio show, and they would do uh, numbers together. One that I can remember particularly vividly is uh, Don't Fence Me In, which features Bing Crosby and the Andrews sisters together. Another group that would, that would sing with uh, um, uh, Bing Crosby and, and were slightly different in a di different kind of way were the Mills Brothers, four African American singers who came out of the out of the black church tradition. And uh, these guys had a tremendous amount of crossover appeal. And by crossover appeal, I mean it was relatively rare for black artists uh, to sell a lot of records to white listeners. So to cross over really meant people thought that you were somebody who probably was, uh, because of your skin color, more appropriate to a rhythm and blues audience. And here you were uh, singing to white audiences. But the Mill Br Mills Brothers had tremendous success in 1943 with Paper Doll and 1944 with You Always Hurt the one you love. With all these tracks, as I say, I really suggest you seek them out on the internet and have a listen to them. And if you can get video of them, uh, that's great, although video is going to be a little bit tough unless they appeared in a film singing it, especially this period before 1945. Now, in the period after the Second World War, after 1945 and leading to 1955, probably the most important person we have to think about is Frank Sinatra. Even though I was we're talking about Bing Crosby having a singing career as a soloist and a movie career and bon vivant and all the kinds of things that's going on with him, um, and the Andrews Sisters and the Mills Brothers, mostly during this big band era of the 1940s where the bands and the instrumentation was the thing, the singers were kind of secondary. It's kind of interesting. Exactly the inverse of what we see in rock and roll tunes. Rock and roll tune, it's, the songs are mostly sung, and then there'll be a guitar solo for a minute, and then the singer will come back in. But with these big band arrangements, they would be mostly played instrumentally. The singer would come in for a minute as kind of a special thing, and then go back out again. And Frank Sinatra, was one of those singers. In fact, there were a bunch of uh, singers who sang with big bands. And m for most of the gig, the singer was on the sideline. The singer would just come out as a kind of featured number, as a kind of featured soloist kind of thing. Frank Sinatra was one of those guys. He had sung with the Harry James Band uh, and with the Tommy Dorsey Band. But in 1943, he launched his career as a solo singer. People thought Frank Sinatra was crazy. How could a singer possibly survive if not attached to one of these big bands. Frank Sinatra at that time was a young, um, attractive, and unlike Bing Crosby who didn't really excite the ladies so much, uh, Frank Sinatra did. The, the girls who used to scream and faint over Frank Sinatra were called the Bobby Soxers, and Frank Sinatra was um, Maybe we think when we look at uh, girls sort of screaming over Elvis or girls screaming over the Beatles later in this course, you'll see that that was happening with Frank Sinatra back in 1943, 1944, uh, 1945. Frank al always gave a lot of credit to the musicians that he'd played with in the big bands, saying that his vocal technique came from watching how those guys played and trying to do with his voice the expressive things the guys in the bands were doing with their instrument. Uh, but as a star, he was, he was clearly a teen idol uh, there for a while. And some representative tracks from this period are Nancy with the Laughing Face from 1945. There's actually a little story that goes with that one. All of Me from 1948.
great and I've got a crush on you from 1948. Think today, what would a song be like that said, I've got a crush on you, honey pie. These were much more innocent days. Actually, Nancy with a laughing face is interesting. Uh, was written by some guys who, whenever they would do a girl's birthday party, would insert whatever the name of that girl was uh, into, the, uh, uh, into the song to personalize the song. And they did it at a birthday party for Frank Sinatra's uh, daughter, Nancy. And, and this, is, this is the way the story goes. Sometimes these stories are apocryphal. Uh, uh, they they, uh, they inserted the name Nancy with the laughing face into the song. And Frank Sinatra misunderstood. He thought they'd written the song, especially for his daughter, and started crying and said, I have to record that song. And so he did, and it became a hit for him. So it's interesting how sometimes these things come together. Some of the other singers that, um, that imitated Frank Sinatra or tried to play on his success, when we talk about Elvis in the 50s and the Beatles in the 60s, we'll talk about how Elvis and the Beatles both started something going, and once they got it going, other musicians, sort of other singers, and acts sort of came in trying to capitalize on the success that they, they had had, sort of ride their coattails in a certain kind of sense. And some of those things happened with Frank Sinatra, too. In 1951, we get Johnny Ray with his emotional delivery of the song Cry, Tony Bennett in 1953 with Rags to Riches, and Eddie Fisher in 1954 with a song called Oh My Papa. In fact, there was a period there in the early 50s where Frank Sinatra was thought to be sort of on the wane, and Eddie Fisher was going to be the next teen heartthrob. Other music that was important on the charts to give you an idea of what popular music sounded like uh, before rock and roll in 1955, Patti Page's Tennessee Waltz from 1950 was a very big hit, and Les Paul and Mary Ford, How High the Moon, 1951, maybe their most important, si uh, uh, maybe their most important single. We'll talk a bit about Les Paul in the next video. So just to review a little bit about what we've talked about, here are some of the most important artists that you're going to want to think about in this period of mainstream pop in the period from about the 1920s, 1930s up to 1955. Bing Crosby, the big bands, the Andrews Sisters, the Mills Brothers, Frank Sinatra, Johnny Ray, Tony Bennett, Eddie Fisher, Patti Page, Les Paul, and Mary Ford. In fact, in the next video, we'll take a specially close look at Les Paul and Mary Ford and some of the great innovations by Les Paul, the guitarist, and so many other things.